are these four issues of liberal democracy, are they being satisfied? Are these four issues that sociology has wrestled with, are they being satisfied? Can sociologists who also think of these four issues look at these numbers again, refract them through the prism of these issues and come up with some other conclusions which are worthwhile, especially in the context of development? And so, we return again to the figures. We return again to the fact that the IT sector is doing so, so brilliantly. And then we look at it carefully and we realize that the IT sector employs but three million people. In fact, the latest economic survey of India was a bit disappointing because the latest economic survey of India said the numbers are roughly 2.5 million. But let us, let us take it at three million and let us say that three million people have generated jobs for four others, 12 million people in all in a country of 1.2 billion and that's certainly not good enough. Or let us take some other sectors. Where is export really going? Where is the cutting edge of a growth and development taking place? Primarily in the export sector. In the export sector, who are the people who actually contribute in export? It is very important to realize that. As you may probably know, that between 1995 and 2004, textile exports went up by over 100%. And who are the people who work in the textile sector? Not the spiffy guys you see in the IT sector. These are the very poor. They come from the informal sector. They do not get proper wages. They have no ESI, no provident fund. And they constitute, by the way, 93% of our labor force. So it is this lot <coughs> that we have to pay attention to. We look through the numbers. The numbers tell us something. And yet, we feel uncomfortable. So then I say, whenever you're uncomfortable with numbers, employ the smell check. Does it smell right? There's something wrong about the numbers. They're wrong because the four criteria of liberal democracy are not really met with in these numbers. 93% are still in the unorganized labor force. But in the export sector, the textile sector has done very well, has contributed a lot. Some of you know perhaps of Panipat, Tirupur, Muradabad, etc., where you have brassware, you have textiles, you have carpets. Carpets are woven in Banaras, Bhadavi, Jonpur, Mirzapur. I don't know how many of you have been there, but India, till very recently, contributed to 11% of the world's trade in carpets. 11%. 15% of India's export in terms of gems and jewelry. You know all about that, how they're made, how diamonds are polished. But who talks about that? This senior side of growth is not discussed because the human element, the four aspects of liberal democracy, are not factored in the way they should have been. And that is why you find that the 93% of the unorganized labor force is not taken into account. Who are the, these people? Where are they producing? What kind of production methods are they using? These are also issues that need to be looked into. In 1960, for example, we produced 5 billion square meters of cloth. In 1960, a lot of cloth. But by 2005, we were producing 26 billion square meters of cloth. 26 billion from 5 billion square meters of cloth. But 85% of this growth happened in the loom sector and not in the mill sector. If you look at, for example, the distribution of organized and unorganized labor, organized labor force is stubbornly sticking around 27 million. And I'm being very charitable because most people say between 23 million or thereabouts. But let us say 27 million, it's not moving from there. It moved by 0.8 million the last two years because women entered the workforce. But one way or the other, whichever way you want to position this data, the fact of the matter is only 27 million people are in the organized labor workforce. To make matters even more, shall we say, sordid, we realize that the organized sector, which in 1999 employed 37.8% of the labor force from the unorganized sector, now employs 46.6% of the labor force. So imagine almost half of the labor force used by the organized sector is from the unorganized sector. Therefore, if you think you bought a Maruti car, which is from the organized sector, think again. Because Maruti cars, Maruti factory has officially recorded that 85% of its labor force comes from the unorganized sector. So this is the way in which we are progressing. This is what we are doing. This is how we're developing. And these, these are the issues that we really need to look at. Why is this growth not translating to development, why do we still have such a large army of people who are in the unorganized sector? And is it true that the rich and the poor live side by side, they need each other, and it is this that leads to growth, and yet we don't pay attention 
to the other half or more than the other half that sustains this growth and this huge success story that India is all about today. I think growth is very important. You cannot develop without growth. You cannot realize the dreams of liberal democracy without growth taking place. You cannot have liberal democracy achieving higher and higher standards in a stagnant economy. It is not possible. Therefore, I do welcome growth. But after that, there's something more that I would like to see. And what I would like to see is the extent to which this growth can translate itself into development and not just remain a numbers game. We don't want our wires crossed. We don't want to be on the same old milk run with the same old things. We want to change. We want to develop. We want to progress. Universalism, choice, ambitions. Look at the ambitions that poor people have. Look at the ambitions that exist in our country. If you go to a village, and most of you have been to villages as field workers or Perhaps some of you even come from rural India. I don't come from rural India, but I've spent many years there. And I can tell you, perhaps because I'm an outsider, such certain things strike me very, very dramatically. You go to a village at 2.33 in the afternoon, a scooter rickshaw turns up, and from that scooter, magic, magically, about 15 children are disgorged, thin, skinny children dragging their satchels, coming back home from a private school. And this private school is not the specific kind of school that you and I imagine. It's a small little place in a village, as you know, private schools range from 50 rupees a month to 275 rupees a month or whatever. I know of two BPL families, admittedly two, and you'll say, what is two? Two is nothing. But I want to give flesh to numbers. So I know of two BPL families who actually send their children to a private school. As I told you earlier, they've tightened the buckle, the belt to such an extent that all that remains is a buckle. Nothing else is there. And this is the kind of tragedy that haunts us. But look at the ambitions, look at the choices, look at the thrust for equality, and their hope that a universal system that, 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 that exists in our country through liberal democracy will see these hopes sustained. In 1980, 1980, just the other day, in 1980, 2% of children went to private schools in 1980. In 2008, imagine the figures. 21% of rural children go to private schools. 52% of urban children go to private schools. Why is that so? It's because there is this drive. We want to realize ourselves. We have ambitions. We have choices. Let's make the most of it. And are we making them available to these people? And this is what liberal democracy dream is about. And this is also, by the way, that sociology should be working. And this is also the dream that sociology should also be entertaining. 2%. 1980, 21%, 52%, look at the numbers, staggering, absolutely. If you look at the way in which people treat illnesses, that again is very revealing. 71%, the Indian Human Development Survey says 71% of people, sick people, seek private medical care, whether urban or rural. 17% go to public hospitals. Why is that so? I don't know. All the records say, that public hospitals are better endowed, have better doctors, have better equipment, and yet they don't go there. They go to private hospitals and they go into debt. As I told you earlier, 39 million people go into poverty every year because of this. Today, 27% of the sick in this country do not seek medical care at all because they don't have the money for it. Can you imagine anything more tragic than that? But that is the way it is. And this is something that we have to pay attention to. So what do we do about these things? What do we do about figures of poverty? Do we look at figures of poverty simply as poverty figures and leave it at that? Or do we try to see to what extent sociology can contribute towards delivering to people such that the lib that democracy, liberal democracy, as we truly know it to be, can be realized? In this context, I have a few suggestions to make. Suggestion number one is that we must be able to look at other people as if they are us. And this is again something that sociology teaches us. And if you say it's not true, I don't agree with you. I've spent 30 years teaching exactly this thing time and time again under different pretexts, that the other is in us. We are not alone, Other are, others are in us, and those who we think are far, far away, not at all connected with us, are actually deeply and intimately related to us. So this is something that sociology has taught us again and again, and we must pay attention to this. So then, the second point, which is also very important, that is this, that target approaches to development, to growth,
don't really work. Targeted approaches. Why don't they work? Simple sociology will tell you why they don't work. They don't work because they don't involve all of us. Targeted approaches work best when they involve all of us. All development processes work best when they involve all of us. But when they don't involve all of us, it doesn't work. We all know that poor people can't fight for their cause. This is the truth. There's no point romanticizing the poor. They can't do it. They have never done it. There's been no society in the world where the poor have actually led a revolution. Other people have led revolutions for the poor. The poor have not. How can they? When I was studying the Bharatiya Kisan Union in West UP, Mahindra Singh Tikai, he's passed away now, Mahindra Singh Tikai told me that he had gone to Palamo in what is now Jharkhand. And he talked to them about how important it was to form a farmers union that would be nationwide in scope. And he talked to them and he talked to them and he said that somehow they weren't listening to me. And I didn't know what was wrong, where was I going wrong? And then when I left the village, I turned back to look at the village, it was enveloped in blackness. It was not there. There was no light. There was no food. And he said to me, how can you imagine that these people would ever join a movement like ours? They don't have the time. They don't have the money. They don't have food in the kitchen to go on dharna one for one month outside the district magistrate's office. From the lips of Mahindra Singh Tikai, I heard a very sophisticated version of Hamza Alvi's middle peasant thesis, that unless you have something in your kitchen, you cannot really revolt. So if you're going to do something for the poor, remember, it is not philanthropy you're doing, it is part of your duty as a, as a, as a bearer of liberal democracy and the traditions of liberal democracy. So after all, when we talk about reservations, for example, are we doing philanthropy? Why, do we, why are we so in, involved in reservations? Why do we think this is an important part of of liberal democracy. Why is it that, liberal, that reservation, for example, carries all these four qualities I mentioned to you, the individual qualities and the collective qualities, why? Because through reservation, we hope to raise the pool of talent which is existing in society such that all of us benefit and all of us prosper. It's not just for this or that section, it is for everybody. And that is why reservations make so much sense to, to our society. At the same time, if we talk about universal health and universal education, that again works. If it's targeted, then you will always have health for the poor, which will be poor health. You'll have health, education for the poor, which will end up as poor education. And that is the truth of the matter. Why is it so? Because people who count, who can make a difference, and who can make a noise are not involved in this process. If you look at the Rashtra Swastha Bhima Yojana, and I've studied that to some length in Northwest India, primarily Haryana, you'll find again that this Rashtra Swastha Bhima Yojana looks very good, but because it is aimed for the poor, can only help the poor, can only give you 30,000 rupees per year, and only for five people in a family, if you have a sixth person in the family, you wish that person were dead, this is not good enough. And therefore, it does not work. So all these policies, which are targeted policies, meant only for a target group, don't work like they should work. Besides, if you say 40% of India is poor, 50% of India is poor, or 77% is poor, where is the target? It's almost the entire society. So how can you have a targeted approach where the entire society is involved? And by the way, let me also discuss another issue with you, and that is this, that liberal democracy doesn't wait, wait for wealth or prosperity to deliver to citizens. It does not wait. If you look at the history of liberal democracy, you'll find that some of the most glorious advances in society were made when those societies were actually quite poor. We think of Sweden today as, a, as the exemplar of social democracy, of social service. But remember, when Sweden started the Falkenheimet program in 1932, it was desperately poor. The unemployment rate was 25%. Over a million people left Sweden for the for, for, for United States because they couldn't get a job and they couldn't get food to eat. At that time, when they were so poor, they thought of this social service program which later on grew into what it is today. They did not say we are poor, let us wait. They said we are poor, but we have citizens and we must look after citizens. The Falkenheimet program is a program which makes the country like a home. The people are people of our home. And that is what it was all about. 
Likewise, you look at the way in which the social service program grew in Canada. It grew in Winnipeg, which was very, very poor during the war and treated very badly by the war, and that is where it grew. The Basque part of Spain died there again. Britain in 1946, after the war, Britain was so poor and so miserable and so wretched, it could not even hang on to India. And that's when it started the National Health Service Program. If you think again, a little further back in history, you will find that Bismarck did some wonderful things, though he's a man we love to hate. Again, he made interventions when Germany was going through a crisis. France, Third Republic, a crisis. That is when things happen, and it happened because they believe in liberal democracy. They believe that our collective wealth and our individual wealth, our collective well-being and our individual well-being are very closely and intricately related. It is this conviction that then spurs people to act the way they have acted. And when sociology is on their side, if they have sociology as their handmaiden, as their tool, then this task gets done better because sociology can remove a large number of misconceptions Sociology can put flesh to numbers. Sociology can also tell you how relevant it is to balance the rule of law within the rule of numbers, the individual and the collective, and also point out that if you're really thinking about ethics, remember, other people count. And this is the example that we have learned from Western, uh, Western philosophy and Western sociology. But think of it from the Indian point of view. All these issues I mentioned to you just now, you find resonance of that, you find reflections of that in Indian sociology. Indian sociology have struggled with similar ideas and similar issues. Perhaps not always keeping in mind the fact that they are actually putting in their best in making liberal democracy come to life. But if we do it self-consciously and if we do it diligently enough and we do it all the time without fail, then I'm sure sociology can deliver more than any other discipline I can think of. And I therefore feel that those of us who are young and those of us who have a life ahead of them and a wonderful life ahead of them, you can make it better and more worthwhile by just doing good sociology because then you'll be doing good liberal democracy and by that you'll be delivering to citizens the way they should be delivered and looked after. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Devangar Gupta, for the excellent deliver, uh, valedictory address you have delivered. Now, I request the rector of the Jawaharlal Nehru University, Professor Sudhapai, to deliver the presidential address. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Jodka, Professor Deepankar Gupta. Professor Tulsi Patel and President of the Sociological Congress. Uh, I'm not giving any presidential address. Thank you for inviting me and uh, I'm very happy that this gathering was held in JNU and so many delegates have been able to come. It was a pleasure to listen to Professor Deepankar Gupta after a long time whom we all know very well and I'm sure you enjoyed his talk, this wide-ranging, uh, you know, description of what is sociology, how one studies society, and so on. Uh, I'm sure the uh, delegates have enjoyed this uh, very much. I'm afraid I have not been able to come for most of these sessions because I was not in Delhi, and so that's been uh, really my loss. But I'm sure the uh, Congress will bring out a publication, and you will be able to put together various kinds of deliberations and I wish you all success. Thank you. I invite Professor Surinder Jodka to propose a sort of thanks. Just another 10 minutes. It won't be more than that, and you'll be liberated. Uh, <laughs> actually, Professor Anand Kumar was to do that, but for some personal family medical reasons, he had to be away. There are two sets of uh, words of thanks that I'm supposed to do. One is uh, for the current session, the other one is for the larger event and both of them are very, very critical and they kind of deserve uh, the formal and as well as substantive vote of thanks. We are indeed very grateful to President Pankar Gupta for having accepted our invitation, actually society's invitation to be here and deliver the valedictory address and to Professor Sudha Pai who is our rector, who has been our patron 
I'll discuss that in a short while again and who has been really very, very helpful to, to have come and presided over this, uh, this, this session and obviously other people. Uh, Indian Sociological Society in a sense uh, showed that trust in us, I remember Mr. Kattakayam started talking to some of us I think nearly eight months back and started persuading us why don't we organize Indian Sociological Society's Diamond Jubilee uh, uh, conference here in GNU. Uh, we initially thought of doing it collectively with other universities in Delhi. We thought maybe Delhi University should do it, that's a bigger department, bigger university. Then we thought of some other ways of uh, uh, getting out of it and finally Professor Anand Kumar was courageous enough to take up this. But we are grateful to Indian Sociological Society to have in a sense given us this responsibility and of course there would be many many problems with the way it has been organized but I think again we must thank our president Professor Katakayam who has not only uh, tolerated our inefficiencies and, 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 and difficulties that he has personally faced but he has also acted as a buffer between all those members of the society who knew his telephone number but could not, could not contact us and he took a lot of burden on himself and it didn't really reach us. I know organizing a big conference where you have nearly 2,000 people uh, coming and nearly 1,400 people have to be provided accommodation in a city like Delhi in, in, in month of December is actually difficult. I'm sure many of you would have felt uncomfortable, but very few uh, of those complaints reached us because he, he worked as, as, as buffer. And also, uh, Mr. Tulsi Patel along with him has been playing all that role of working as buffer, working with us as, as organizers and, 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 and working very hard. Another person who has been uh, working with us is Professor Jairam Panda, who has also, along with them, been sitting in the office of Indian Sociological Society and doing all kind of thankless, invisible work. And that has been kind of, you know, uh, we are of course very grateful to the way people have responded from all over India to be part of this uh, Indian Sociological Society. Uh, organizing an event like this is obviously expensive. We got some money from UGC, from ICSSR, from other universities, from here. But I think most importantly, the kind of support we got from our own university. I remember when we first approached the Vice Chancellor, we were thinking of 1 lakh rupees, then we wrote a letter asking for 3 lakh rupees, and then we met our rector, and she encouraged us that, you know, you know think big. And finally, because of her personal intervention, we were able to get 7 lakh rupees from the Jawaharlal Nehru University. And this is something which uh, has never happened before. Uh, no vice chancellor in any university has given 7 lakh rupees to the conference. No department in GNU has ever received 7 lakh rupees for organizing a conference or seminar. So I think this is something for which we, we thank both our vice chancellor, Professor Sopuri, and uh, our rector, uh, 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 Professor Pai. And uh, as you would have seen, uh, Professor Supuri came for three or four events himself. He spent so much time, he kind of has been with us uh, in, 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 in this uh, conference. Uh, we are also grateful to the other bodies, particularly uh, you know, International Sociological Society and, and various other. We are grateful to all the speakers who participated uh, as plenary speakers and chairpersons of different sessions and uh, uh, people who, who who did the actual work of running RCs, which again were kind of visible, invisible activities. Professor T.K. Umman, who is, who is our professor emeritus, has actually been working much more than most of us have been doing. And he has been personally taken interest. He is not only a kind of uh, nominal chair of, of the organizing committee, he actually worked very hard and worked with us and, and guided us in many different ways uh, to organize things. Um, Renuka Singh worked on the brochure and abstracts and, 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 and you have those booklets and they look very nice and it kind of, you know, uh, I remember one day early morning Anand Kumar took me along to Sheila Dixit's house and we were a little hesitant whether we should ask for money to the Chief Minister of Delhi or not and we met her and he hesitantly approached her. She said, haan, bataiye kya chahiye? <laughs> and we said, okay, one dinner and how much does it cost? We said, okay, three lakh rupees. Haan, haan, bilkul lijiye. And she was very, very kind of uh, supportive. Uh, as I told you earlier, Vice Chancellor of Ambedkar University also supported us, Vice Chancellor of, uh, of, 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 of uh, Department of Jamia Milia Islamia uh, and, and many other institutions, neighboring institutions uh, supported us. 
uh, IIT, without which I don't think we would have been able to think of organizing this conference. Nearly 800 delegates were in, in IIT, uh, whatever might have been the quality of accommodation, you just don't get accommodation. So I think that has been a great help, uh, particularly the, the, the interest Mr. Ravinder Kaur took in, uh, with us in, in organizing our Dean, Prof. Zoya Hassan, Sage Publications, who brought out uh, uh, the six volumes. Uh, Oxford University Press also supported us uh, uh, in, in, in bringing out, uh, uh, in, 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 in uh, funding, I think, one of the T's. And then we have had a fairly good amount of publicity of this event through various newspapers. Uh, several of the Hindi-speaking newspapers published uh, uh, special issues, uh, Veer Arjun, Sahara, uh, and, 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 and Doordarshan has been recording, uh, Dainik Bhaskar, uh, Doordarshan has been recording the proceedings of this conference. Uh, what else? Uh, <laughs> uh, Dr. Prashant Neki of Jamia Milia Islamia, who has been in charge of, of, of media uh, and, 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 and various other people uh, who work with, with, with us. But most importantly, I think we must thank our students. And this organization, this conference, I think more than any other conference, has been organized by our students. I'm sure some of them would have not been there at 7.30 in the morning as promised, but they are JNU students. They're used to sleeping after 2 o'clock and they wake up at 9 o'clock. So there were, there were problems, but believe me, they have worked very, very hard. And I've, I've personally been seeing, and they've been working for like last one month, a uh, couple of them, and then for last 10 days, a large group of them, and during this period also, there might have been some, some, some problems, but, but I think our students have done a great job and we must thank them. And finally, since I am the chairperson of my center, I must also thank faculty of the CSSS and faculty of other social science centers who have, who, have, who, have, who have tolerated our presence in their buildings and have been very, very cooperative. Thank you very much. Once again. Thank you, Professor Jodka. Now, I invite Professor Tulase Patel to propose a vote of thanks on behalf of the Indian Sociological Society. Professor Jacob John Katakayam. President Indian Sociological Society, Professor G.R. Panda, Treasurer, Indian Sociological Society, Professor Sudha Pai, Rector, JNU, Professor Dipankar Gupta, who many of us claim as ours. D school would, D school would say he is our, our person, JNU would say he is our person, so special. <laughs> Professor Surendra Chodka, um, who is special to ISS, uh, colleagues and friends, including all senior colleagues, with due respect. Uh, like all good things that come to an end, uh, this conference is also coming to a close now. Uh, it's tough to speak in the end and propose a vote of thanks after a vote of thanks has been proposed by the chair of the department. There might be some repetitions, but kindly bear with me, because this is the only occasion I'll get to acknowledge the kind of debt I'm going back with. The um, All India Sociological Conference has had an overwhelming response from all quarters. The occasion of the ISS Diamond Jubilee Year and the fame of JNU have so enthusiastically engaged the numbers and large number of members of the ISS to participate in the conference and symposia and their respective RCs that it is truly impressive to find the hall full and so many people sitting on the floor and standing for this um, last vote of thanks part. The manner in which uh, information technology was deployed by JNU is really admirable, and especially by sociology, which is not so technically savvy. Those who could, could not find a seat in this auditorium did not have to 
miss out on the talks given by the plenary speakers. They could stand out in the open, sip a cup of tea, or sit in the room opposite this auditorium to see and to listen to the presentations. The perfectly signaged RC room arrangement enabled the RC business to be carried out efficiently. The perfectly organized inaugural session is truly memorable. It's an example of a meticulous planning known, for, known with, to go with Professor T.K. Uman's chairmanship and his personality. His efforts really bore fruits for all of us that morning. The Vice Chancellor, Professor Sapori, the Dean of Social Sciences, Professor Zoya Hassan, the Rector, Professor Sudha Pai, Professor Susan Vishwanath, Professor Surinder Jodka, and both the out, outgoing and the incoming heads of the Sociology Center at JNU deserve a special mention for enabling this conference through all its stages. Dr. Renuka Singh's contribution towards bringing out the souvenir and the book of abstracts has been our roadmap during this conference. Dr. Vivek Kumar's resourcefulness will be long lasting with us through the kit we are taking with us. Dr. G. Srinivas and Professor S. Anul Haq in their quiet manner contributed in significant ways at critical and routine times. Other colleagues from the department took on their roles in this elaborate division of labor. The support staff left by, led by Bharatji smoothened many administrative hiccups over these days. Most of all, these are two very, there are two very big thanks truly earned, one by the amazing organizing secretary, Professor Anand Kumar, who despite critical odds against him has unbelievably efficiently handled all preparations and proceedings of this Diamond Jubilee Conference. It is truly a bravely carried out responsibility, not easy even for an extraordinarily gifted human being. The team of several dozens of volunteers from the department who have worked round the clock for the last four days and many of them have not had a chance to even have a wink of sleep, and they have worked overtime for the last few months, deserve all our appreciation and applause. It's not very easy to be volunteers who are primarily researchers, to work as human relations experts and practitioners. These students were at points brought to encounter some rough behavior from the delegates. It is rather unbecoming of us as delegates to push the volunteers against the wall when they have bent backwards to make all possible arrangements on behalf of the delegates, for the delegates. And now, on behalf of all the delegates and on behalf of ISS, I express my apologies to all the volunteers. Of course, I understand that there are one or two untoward instances that may happen in these gatherings and we all need to bear with it. And of this magnitude, it is not expected, but it does happen. But I'm sure we are all departing with sweet memories of this warm and fruitful conference where tea and food was in plenty and so were the scholarly lectures over these three days. Finally, I express my appreciation to all the delegates who have, through their participation, made this Diamond Jubilee Conference what it has been. I also thank the office staff of the Indian Sociological Society who have set up a temporary office in the center and supported the functions that are required to run such conferences. I would fail in my duty if I did not put on record the constant encouragement and ambition to reach certain heights and to take ISS to certain heights for the past two years by the ISS President John Katakayam and <laughs> the humorous spirit of Professor J.R. Panda of the ICSR Treasurer who would often do a balancing act. 
and kept the account books rising up for ISS. Thank you both for your cooperation and support in this teamwork. Finally, I thank all of you, all the life members of ISS, who posed in me the confidence to be your secretary of the ISS. I hope I have performed to your satisfaction and assume And I assume I've tried my best to carry forward the baton for ISS in real earnest. Along with my thanks to you all, I bid you goodbye. <laughs> One last acknowledgement that I want to make is we have amongst us a very senior uh, colleague, a life member, who's an advocate by profession, Shri Sambhaji Rao Ghodajkare, who is a doctorate in sociology from Marathwada University, Nanded. And he has been coming constantly to every conference and has, and all on his, team and that is the spirit that we all go back with. Thank you all once again. So the Diamond Jubilee celebrations and the 37th All India Sociological Conference is concluded. The time management that is the most uh, effectively we could do it because we have started exactly at 9.30 on 11th and at exactly at 7 p.m. we are concluding. So thank you very much once again and uh, please.